I'm Kathy Hawk with the American Bar Association's Division for Public Education, and I am thrilled to welcome you to the final session for our virtual Federal Trials and Great Debates in American History, Judicial Independence. For this session, we will be exploring teaching with primary sources, and I am thrilled to introduce you to our two historians who will help walk you through how to use primary sources as you investigate judicial independence. From the Federal Judicial Center's History Office, we will be joined by Jake Kobrick, Assistant Historian. Jake has a PhD from the University of Maryland, College Park, and a JD from the University of Pennsylvania. With him will be the Director of the History Office, Christine Lamberson. Christine has a PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and prior to joining the FJC, was a Professor of History for many years at Angelo State. Christine and Jake, thank you for exploring these documents with us today. Hello, thank you for joining us. Jake and I are going to be taking a look at a few primary sources related to one of the cases discussed in session two, Ex parte McArdle. In this case, the Supreme Court had to rule on whether Congress could remove a pending case from its jurisdiction. The case had significant implications for judicial independence and the balance of power between Congress and the courts. In this session, we will illustrate the work of legal historians by reading and interpreting primary sources to give us a deeper understanding of this case and its historical context. This video series as a whole is, context, is connected excuse me, to cases that shape the federal courts, a resource that you can find online in the history section of fjc.gov. There you will find all the primary sources we are discussing today, as well as historical analysis, and discussion questions related to this case and others about judicial independence, including all of the cases discussed in this series. You'll also find similar materials for cases about other topics. Today, we are going to discuss three primary sources. Again, you can find those in cases that shape the federal courts. The three documents are a newspaper editorial from Louisville, Kentucky, a veto message from President Andrew Johnson, and the Supreme Court's opinion in Ex parte McArdle. We recommend that you read those sources before watching this session. Before we dive into our first source, let's remind ourselves about what has happened to this point in the case. William McArdle was arrested in November of 1867 when his lawyers sought a writ of habeas corpus from the U.S. Circuit Court. The judge found that his detention was legal. Then in March of 1868, the Supreme Court heard arguments in an appeal of that decision. McArdle had appealed, relying in part on the appellate jurisdiction granted by the Habeas Corpus Act of 1867. In March of 1868, the same month that the Supreme Court heard arguments, Congress repealed the appellate jurisdiction granted by the Habeas Corpus Act. This editorial was published right after Congress passed that repeal as the repeal legislation went to Johnson's desk. Our first document, uh, which is called the anti mccardle Measure, it's an editorial from the Louisville Daily Journal dated March 24th, 1868. Um, I'm not going to read the entire excerpt that we have on our website. I would encourage you to do so, um, but I'm just going to read a few sentences that will help to guide our discussion of the document. The repeal is leveled directly at the McArdle case. It is simply an anti mccardle measure. This indeed was admitted by one of the repeal supporters on subsequently being held to account for the disgraceful trickery which he and his associates had practiced upon the Democrats. And now there's an excerpt from a debate on the floor of the House of Representatives and the speaker is Robert Schenck, who's a Republican from Ohio. Sir, I have lost confidence in the majority of the Supreme Court of the United States. Is not that plain enough? I believe that they usurp power whenever they dare to undertake to settle questions purely political in regard to the status of states. Now I hold that the Supreme Court of the United States are the majority of them, proceeding step by step to the usurpation of jurisdiction that does not belong to them. And I hold it to be not only my right, but my duty as a representative of the people to clip the wings of that court wherever I can in any attempt to take such flights. Now this is back to the author of the editorial. This is at once an admission that the Supreme Court, if it decides the McArdle case, must decide it for McArdle, and that the object of this repeal is to snatch the case from the court before a decision can be reached. 
Can Congress snatch from the Supreme Court a particular case which has not been merely docketed but argued and submitted? Is not such a divestment unconstitutional? In our judgment, it clearly is. It is, as we conceive, an exercise of judicial power on the part of Congress, or an interference with the exercise of judicial power by the judiciary, either of which is contrary to the Constitution, which declares that the judicial power of the federal government shall be exercised by the federal judiciary and by no other body. Furthermore, it lessens the means of legal defense which existed when the alleged offense was committed, which in point of principle is equivalent to lessening the evidence required to convict the alleged offender. And this, as all the authorities acknowledge, falls within the constitutional prohibition of ex post facto laws. The measure, it appears to us, is doubly unconstitutional. So the first thing you're going to want to do when you're reading primary sources is think about who's writing the source, what type of source is it? So this is an editorial and it's coming from Kentucky. So we want to start with what do we know about Kentucky? Kentucky was a border state. It did not secede. It was one of four slave states that did not secede. However, it had the most slaveholding families of any border state. And so though it was governed by unionists, they opposed undermining slavery. Uh, state officials denounced the Emancipation Proclamation, for example. So it's not too surprising that many people in Kentucky would oppose military reconstruction, even though the state itself was not subjected to it. So let's see what this document tells us about the arguments on both sides of the issue. Uh, the issue being, can Congress remove a pending case from the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court? Um, before, before we get to that, though, there's one sort of interesting side note to this document. Um, what does the editorial author mean by the disgraceful trickery uh, that he claims the Republicans have practiced? Um, what happened there was the Republicans attached the Repeal Act as a last second amendment to a completely unrelated judiciary bill that had to do with tax appeals um, that they had presented as very technical and very unobjectionable, um, and they just passed it through very quickly now, they did read the amendment on the floor, but as the Democrats claim, they had sort of lulled the Democrats into not paying attention to it. Um, so that caused controversy. The Republicans would have had the votes to pass the bill anyway, but the feeling on the part of the Democrats that they had been tricked contributed to some bad blood over the issue. So the excerpts from uh, Robert Schenck's statements on the floor of the House give us a good insight into what the Republican motives were for passing uh, the Repeal Act. So one thing he says is that the court has usurped power by deciding political questions. What does he mean by that? Um, that is almost certainly a reference to a case called Ex Parte Milligan that the Supreme Court decided in 1866. Um, the court in that case was faced with the question of whether a civilian who had been charged with inciting insurrection uh, could be tried before a military commission. Uh, rather than a civilian court. And this case took place in Indiana, which of course was not part of the rebellion, was not part of the Confederacy. It was not under military occupation at the time. Uh, the civilian federal courts were in operation. So under those circumstances, the Supreme Court said, no, the Bill of Rights prohibits this. You cannot try Milligan uh, by a military commission. He has a right to a trial in a civilian court. Now, the reason that's important is uh, the court did not in Milligan have before it the question of what would happen in a state that had been part of the rebellion and was under military occupation. But there were statements in, in the opinion that suggested that had that case been in a state like Mississippi, the court might have decided the same way. Uh, and therefore, that drew into question, is the court going to find all of military reconstruction unconstitutional? Um, so that was obviously of great concern to the Republicans. Um, the other most important statement I think Shank makes is that the court has arrogated jurisdiction to itself that doesn't belong to it. So what does he mean by that? Um, the Republicans took a position that the Habeas Corpus Act of 1867 should not apply to ex parte McArdle. And as we'll discuss a little bit further down the road, they did argue that in front of the Supreme Court, and that was a losing argument. Um, but they argued the court couldn't hear that case even before the Republicans passed the Repeal Act. So what the Habeas Corpus Act of 1867 does is it expands the ability to go to a federal court for a writ of habeas corpus to a prisoner who's held in state custody. 
Uh, generally speaking, before 1867, if you were held by state authorities, you had no right to go to a federal court seeking a writ of habeas corpus. So the 1867 Act expands it to state prisoners, and it's a reconstruction measure. Uh, the point of it is to give African Americans and Republicans in the South protection against being uh, locked up arbitrarily for illegitimate reasons um, by Southern state officials. So the Republicans said, well, based on that, uh, this law really should apply only to, um, to state prisoners, and it should not apply to federal prisoners like McArdle. So those are, those are basically the arguments on the Republican side of this. Right. So Jake is finding all of these arguments on the Republic, Republican side in this editorial because the editorial quotes Shank extensively. However, the editorial is doing that in order to criticize the Republicans' argument because the editorial itself is actually opposing the repeal. So let's look at those anti-repeal arguments. So most importantly, they say taking away jurisdiction in a pending case is unconstitutional. They see the Repeal Act as targeting McArdle, specifically targeting that case, and they say the proponents admit that. That's what they're quoting this uh, Representative Shank to prove. They also say that such targeting is unconstitutional because they refer to the Repeal Act as an ex post facto law. Um, we're going to discuss that a little further with the next document, which also uh, makes a similar point. Finally, the editorial argues that the mere fact that Congress wants to go to all this trouble to get this case um, out of the Supreme Court suggests that they know McCardle will win. Uh, so they sort of are saying that the Republicans are admitting defeat by trying to make sure that the Supreme Court cannot rule. So in thinking about this case's connection to judicial independence, one of the things that we're seeing here is there's actually a decent amount of agreement about what Congress was trying to do. Specifically, both sides agree that this jurisdiction stripping measure was at least in part aimed at the McArdle case. They both agree that the repeal act would take away jurisdiction from a pending case. The issue, the question here, the disagreement is that one side thought this was unconstitutional, while the other side thought that it was a perfectly reasonable check on the court and on a court specifically that they claimed had been stretching its power. So the question here is really about drawing the line, at least the question as presented in the editorial, is about drawing the line between the court's powers and Congress's powers. It's about judicial independence, about the proper interpretation of congressional powers in relation to judicial manner, matters under the Constitution. So let's turn to our second document now and see what President Andrew Johnson had to say about these questions. So this document dates from the day after uh, the Louisville Daily Journal editorial. So on March 25th, 1868, that repeal act had gotten to Johnson's desk, Johnson vetoes it, and in this message, he explains why. Uh, now, before we get to the document, just by way of background, it's important to understand uh, what President Johnson's relationship with Congress was like and how that might have informed his views on the subject uh, of the McArdle case and the repeal act. Uh, simply put, Johnson was famously at war with the Republicans in Congress for his entire presidential term. Uh, and the main point of disagreement was that he wanted lenient terms for the readmission of the Confederate states that had seceded from the Union. Um, he wanted the Union stitched back together as quickly as possible. Uh, and the Republicans differed with that extremely. Um, he initially allowed the Southern states to reestablish their own governments very quickly. Uh, and sometimes uh, leading Confederates, the very people who, who had been responsible for the rebellion, were back in power in those states. Uh, he opposed the federal government requiring uh, that the states grant suffrage to African-American men. He wanted this left just to state law. Um, he also declared amnesty in 1868 for all who had participated in the rebellion. He had granted a limited amnesty in December of 1865, but then in the spring of 1868, he just issues basically a blanket pardon for everyone. Uh, one notable consequence of that was that it halted the treason prosecution of former Confederate President Jefferson Davis in federal court in Virginia. Uh, so Congress fought back against this in several ways. Um, in 1865, they refused to seat the delegations that had been elected to Congress from the Southern states. Uh, 
Um, they passed several bills over Johnson's veto, most notably the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Uh, the Freedmen's Bureau Act of 1866, and then, of course, the law that's at issue in McArdle, the Military Reconstruction Act of 1867. Uh, and then, of course, most notably, uh, while all this is going on, this controversial controversy over the Repeal Act, uh, Congress is in the midst of impeaching Johnson over an unrelated matter. Okay, so let's look at the document. Once again, I am not going to read the whole excerpt, but I would encourage you to do so. So I'm going to read a portion to set up uh, the part that I'm reading, Johnson starts in this document by saying that he cannot deprive anyone of a right of appeal, and then he shifts to talking about the jurisdiction granted by the Habeas Corpus Act of 1867 uh, that was being repealed now. So I'll pick up there. He is saying that the act was passed, quote, because it was believed to be necessary and right. Nothing has since occurred to disprove the wisdom and justness of the measures and to modify it as now proposed would be to lessen the protection of the citizen from the exercise of arbitrary power and to weaken the safeguards of life and liberty, which can never be made too secure against illegal encroachments. The bill not only prohibits the adjudication by the Supreme Court of cases in which appeals may hereafter be taken, but interdicts its jurisdiction on appeals which have already been made to that high judicial body. If, therefore, it should become a law, it will, by its retroactive operation, wrest from the citizen a remedy which he enjoyed at the time of his appeal. It will thus operate most harshly upon those who believe that justice has been denied them in the inferior courts. The legislation proposed in the second section, it seems to me, is not in harmony with the spirit and intention of the Constitution. It cannot fail to affect most injuriously the just equipoise of our system of government, for it establishes a precedent which, if followed, may eventually sweep away every check on arbitrary and unconstitutional legislation. Thus far, during the existence of the government, the Supreme Court of the United States has been viewed by the people as the true expounder of their constitution. And in the most violent party conflicts, its judgments and decrees have always been sought and deferred to with confidence and respect. So I'll stop there and start analyzing Johnson's argument here. So let's look at what he's saying and why he says he wants to or he has to veto the Repeal Act. So first, he says that the reasons for passing the original Habeas Corpus Act of 1867, including the appellant jurisdiction at issue here, have not changed. Now, Johnson, again, doesn't mention what Jake mentioned earlier, that the reasons Congress supported the act in the first place did not include cases like McArdle's. In fact, as a whole, Johnson is quite a bit less direct than the editorial about the repeal's connection to the McArdle case specifically. He never mentions McArdle by name, for example. Uh, but still, Johnson argues that stripping jurisdiction from a pending case would be unfair uh, to anyone with a case in front of the court, which means McArdle. Uh, so he mentions several ideals about the protection of liberty, of individual liberty in particular being at stake here, framing the ability to appeal a lower court decision as key to protecting that liberty and that being the real issue. I want to mention one other point that goes unmentioned here. Uh, and again, it's important that when we read documents that we do so in context. In a case like this, we know a lot about Johnson's views. He's, he's president, right? We have lots of other statements we can look at. So we want to keep those in mind while we're reading this one. So Johnson likely had the Military Reconstruction Act in mind here as well. Many people thought that the court would rule on its constitutionality when it ruled uh, on McArdle's detention here as well. They thought those things would come together. And if you'll remember, Johnson opposed military reconstruction. He had also vetoed the Military Reconstruction Act, but Congress had overrode that veto as well. So he likely has that in mind, even though he doesn't mention it in this document. Johnson makes a couple of other arguments that I'd like to address. Uh, one of them is that he says that this law, the Repeal Act, is unfair because of its retroactive application. What he means there, of course, is that it applies to cases that were already filed and argued and pending before the Supreme Court. Um, that's very similar to what the editorial we read said when it called the Repeal Act an ex post facto law. 
So it's important to understand what that means. Uh, the Supreme Court had defined back in 1810 in the case of Calder v. Bull what an ex post facto law was, which, which is something that the Constitution prohibits Congress from passing. Uh, and the court said basically that not every law with retroactive application is necessarily an ex post facto law. Uh, a, a civil piece of legislation, for example, that operates retroactively is not an ex post facto law. Uh, an ex post facto law is something that imposes criminal liability after the fact for an act that was legal at the time that it was done. Uh, so if you look at the Repeal Act, the Repeal Act is just jurisdiction. It just says the Supreme Court shall not have jurisdiction over this category of appeals. It doesn't impose any criminal liability for anything. Um, so that part of the argument is, at least according to the Supreme Court, is incorrect. The Repeal Act doesn't fall within any constitutional prohibition on ex post facto laws. Um, the other really important uh, claim that Johnson makes is that the Repeal Act could end up sweeping away all checks on unconstitutional legislation. Uh, and what he means by that is that this could set a, a, tr a huge precedent. Uh, if, if the Repeal Act, if Congress overrides his veto and if the Supreme Court upholds the act uh, and the court is thus deprived of jurisdiction over McArdle, What's to stop the court from in the future, Johnson is saying, from looking at the court's docket, looking at any particular cases it would prefer that the court not decide, and just plucking those cases away from the Supreme Court, just the way it did with McArdle. So if it seems like the court might be about to repeal an important piece of federal legislation uh, that the majority of Congress supports, maybe they'll just pass an act saying the Supreme Court no longer has jurisdiction over this case. So what Johnson is talking about is a potential threat to judicial review uh, and thereby um, something that would really tremendously change the balance of power between Congress and the federal courts. Uh, now we're going to turn to document three, which is the court's opinion in McArdle. But by way of background, uh, we need to understand exactly where we are uh, in the case at this point. So McArdle was a newspaper editor in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Um, he had written some incendiary editorials against Reconstruction and very critical of military authorities. He was arrested by military authorities in November of 1867 for inciting violence and insurrection and impeding Reconstruction. He was supposed to be tried by a military commission pursuant to the Military Reconstruction Act. Uh, he sought a writ of habeas corpus from the U.S. Circuit Court um, in the Southern District of Mississippi under the Act of 1867. So the Circuit Court grants the writ of habeas corpus, but that doesn't mean necessarily that McArdle will be released. It just means that military officials have to bring him before the court, which will then evaluate the legality of his detention. So after a hearing, the court rules that his detention is legal. So normally McArdle would have been remanded back into the custody of the military authorities to wait to await his trial by the military commission. But in this particular case, uh, the federal judge grants him a thousand dollars bail. So McArdle is released. He actually goes back to writing his fiery editorials. Uh, and so his trial before the military commission is going to be delayed until his appeal to the Supreme Court can be resolved. Uh, the case gets to the Supreme Court. Uh, the government files a motion saying the court doesn't have jurisdiction over this because, as I mentioned earlier, the argument is that the 1867 Habeas Corpus Act only applies to state prisoners, whereas McArdle is a federal prisoner. The Supreme Court rejects that argument and says we do have jurisdiction over this case. Uh, the case is then argued on the merits. And it's while the case is pending before the court, it's been argued, but it hasn't yet been decided. Uh, that's when the Repeal Act comes in. So then the court says, we're going to ask the parties to argue the question of whether the Repeal Act actually does deprive us of jurisdiction over this case. So that's where the case is uh, when this opinion comes in in April of 1869. Uh, the other important piece of context to understand for this opinion has to do with the relationship between Congress and the court. Um, Congress obviously has certain oversight powers over the Supreme Court. Um, and during the Civil War, and Reconstruction, they had exercised those powers in a couple of significant ways. Uh, one was a reorganization of the judicial circuits um, that began in 1862. 
Um, there was a tradition at that time that one justice would be appointed from each judicial circuit. And at that time, uh, at the outbreak of the Civil War, five out of the nine circuits were composed of slave states, entirely of slave states. Uh, so you would have a majority of the members of the Supreme Court coming from the slave states. So Congress changes that by reorganizing the circuits, uh, and they made the number of circuits composed of slave states go down from five to three in 1862, uh, and then they, re they reorganized them again, uh, and it went from three to two in 1866. So by doing that, they're lessening Southern influence on the court. They're allowing the president to appoint uh, Southern justices or to replace Southern justices who may be retiring with justices from the North. Uh, the other thing they did in 1866 was they provided for a gradual reduction in the size of the Supreme Court. Uh, at that time, it had been 10, uh, and they provided for a reduction down to seven. Um, the court got as small as eight before Congress uh, changed course on that and set the size of the court at nine in 1869, and that's where it's remained ever since. Um, but the reason that's relevant here is that the court in deciding McArdle was probably very aware of the fact that Congress had these oversight powers and may have been somewhat wary of antagonizing Congress further in this particular case. Uh, so as before, I'm not gonna read the entire excerpt that we have on our site. I'm just gonna read uh, a few key parts that will inform our discussion. So this is the court's decision in McArdle dated April 12th, 1869. The first question necessarily is that of jurisdiction, for if the act of March 1868 takes away the jurisdiction defined by the act of February 1867, it is useless, if not improper, to enter into any discussion of other questions. The provision of the act of 1867 affirming the appellate jurisdiction of this court in cases of habeas corpus is expressly repealed. It is hardly possible to imagine a plainer instance of positive exception. We are not at liberty to inquire into the motives of the legislature. We can only examine into its power under the Constitution. And the power to make exceptions to the appellate jurisdiction of this court is given by express words. Without jurisdiction, the court cannot proceed at all in any cause. Jurisdiction is power to declare the law. And when it ceases to exist, the only function remaining to the court is that of announcing the fact and dismissing the cause. The general rule supported by the best elementary writers is that when an act of the legislature is repealed, it must be considered, except as the transactions passed and closed, as if it never existed. It is quite clear, therefore, that this court cannot proceed to pronounce judgment in this case, for it no longer has jurisdiction of the appeal. Counsel seem to have supposed, if effect be given to the repealing act in question, that the whole appellate power of the court in cases of habeas corpus is denied. But this is an error. The Act of 1868 does not accept from that jurisdiction any cases but appeals from circuit courts under the Act of 1867. It does not affect the jurisdiction which was previously exercised. The appeal of the petitioner in this case must be dismissed for want of jurisdiction. So the first thing we want to do is look at what did the court actually decide and what was the legal basis for the decision. So the court here says that it did not have jurisdiction to hear McArdle's appeal. It says that Congress can make jurisdictional exceptions to the constitutional granting of appellant jurisdiction. This is very clear in the Constitution. The legislation itself was also very clear. First, Congress granted a particular sort of appellate jurisdiction and then it very clearly repealed that specific type of jurisdiction. So McArdle's lawyers had argued that Congress cannot take the court's appellate jurisdiction away because it derived from the Constitution. And the court rejected this argument. The court acknowledges that it does come from the Constitution, its appellate jurisdiction, but the Constitution very clearly says Congress can make exceptions to this jurisdiction. So here, the court is saying the situation is really very clear. We don't have to infer a negation of jurisdiction that wasn't granted. We don't have to really look into the legislation uh, too much at all. Rather, the jurisdiction was repealed in extremely explicit, expressed terms. So the court says that it's very clear they don't have jurisdiction.
Um, there's one last point about this opinion that I wanted to mention, um, and I think it's maybe the most interesting part of the opinion, and it comes in at the very end uh, where Congress says that the repeal of jurisdiction under the Habeas Corpus Act of 1867 did not deprive it of jurisdiction it exercised before 1867. Uh, now, this statement is dicta, which means it's not crucial to the holding. It's more of an aside that the court is making. Uh, and when the court says jurisdiction it exercised before, what it means is the original Judiciary Act, the Act of 1789, which gave it appellate jurisdiction in habeas corpus cases where the prisoner was held under federal authority. Uh, now, this very issue came up shortly afterwards in 1869 in a case called Ex Parte Jurger. Uh, and there, the case had to do with a prisoner who was in federal custody uh, and who did uh, send an appeal to the Supreme Court under the Act of 1789. Uh, the government tried to argue that the 1789 Act had been implicitly repealed by the Act of 1867. Uh, the court rejected that argument. The court said uh, that repeal by implication is not, is not favored. Uh, there was nothing in the 1867 Act to suggest that it was repealing any prior act. Uh, so the court did maintain its jurisdiction that it had had since 1789 in these habeas corpus cases with federal prisoners. And the reason that's interesting is McArdle was also a federal prisoner. Um, that's something the Republicans stressed when they said the 1867 Act shouldn't apply to him. He's a federal prisoner. So that raises a very interesting question, which I won't attempt to answer. Uh, and that question is, could the court have retained jurisdiction over McArdle under the 1789 Act, even if it determined that its jurisdiction under the 1867 Act was repealed? So now we've read three documents and we've analyzed each of them individually. Let's look at them together uh, for a moment. So this is a key step in a historian's work, right? We don't very often, uh, pretty much never look at one primary source alone. Rather, we're looking at several together in order to get a complete sense of the historical moment or in, in uh, our office of the case. So these three primary sources highlight different perspectives on Ex parte McArdle, but also on how much independence the court should have or did have on the separation of powers and on the proper interpretation of the Constitution. It's clear when we look at them together that people on both sides of the political argument here agreed about the goal of the Repeal Act. They both understood that it was aimed at the McArdle case. The question here was its constitutionality. Fundamentally, this was a fight about the separation of powers, about judicial independence and about the Constitution and, and how to interpret it. How much independence did the courts have? Could Congress withdraw jurisdiction in order to target an already pending case? These are the political questions at hand in, in this fight between Congress, between the president that we're seeing uh, playing out in the editorial as well. We also can see that the political arguments about this case were closely connected to a larger argument over the constitutionality of military reconstruction and the desire or fear, depending on which side you were on, of what would happen if the court ruled on the constitutionality of military reconstruction. The court ultimately said that the constitution did not, did, excuse me, did allow Congress to exert power, the exact power that Johnson and the Louisville Daily Journal opposed. But you'll note the opinion is very focused. It outlines clearly and carefully the constitutional power granted to Congress and really focuses on the jurisdiction question and very much focuses on the specific facts and legal questions of this case. Unlike the editorial and President Johnson's message, the court did not bring in these other political or legal questions after stating that the court did not have jurisdiction in this particular instance. So the court, in fact, never actually ruled on the question of the constitutionality of military reconstruction. So thank you for joining us. These are rich documents about an important case. And uh, we hoped that, hope that you learned from what we talked about today. And we have a few additional discussion questions on the screen that you can uh, discuss or think about yourself. And again, you can find more material on this case and on others in cases that shape the federal courts on fjc.gov. Thank you, Jake, for joining me for this session. And thank you to all of the participants throughout the series.
finally, thank you to viewers for watching.